Ah, uh, there we are. The the shofar being blown. Uh, it is uh, sukkah. Uh, for many of us, it started um, about an hour or so ago with the sunset. For others, it is still to arrive, as it would be for you, Kirk, in California. Yes. Probably even mm-hmm. for JB and uh, in Texas. So we are uh, we are celebrating sukkah. I had to um, ask uh, Yah for a, uh, a hezekiah. Uh, I tried this evening, but I got a, a bug, uh, a virus uh, yesterday, and it really took me for a loop. Uh, high temperature, uh, nausea, um, lethargy, uh, joint pain, and I thought it was going to be a lot better today and started off better, but as the day wore on, I got weaker and weaker to the point where uh, about an hour ago, I had to sit in scalding hot water just to get rid of the chills, so. Uh, you know, I'm playing it uh, with a half deck or maybe a 10% deck tonight. So if I stumble over my words, and I sound really stupid tonight. You'll know what uh, what uh, what the yeah. reason behind it is. And you know, and listen, I've been sick in seven years, so I'm I've I've no complaints whatsoever. But I did want everybody to know. So when I I bail out uh, in an hour and uh, leave the show to uh, to Kirk, uh, you'll understand why I left. It's just that. Uh, I need to get back to bed. Kirk, at the end of the show, you're going to talk about one of my favorite words, Anna. It is a, mm-hmm. uh, a verb. And the only thing I wanted to say, and I tried to express it to you before the show began, and I was, I understood it in my mind and couldn't say, express it in words. So I'm going to try it just to share my uh, thoughts on it, and then I'm going to leave you to go over your notes uh, later okay. on. Anna is the word that is, uh, uh, whose primary meaning is to answer and respond. It is used in conjunction with Yahweh inviting us to attend the Moed Mikre, for example, Sukkah. So if someone issues an invitation, the only natural thing to do is you RSVP, you respond, uh, and you answer the invitation. Uh, even if it's a summons, you need to answer the summons, particularly considering who this is coming from. And, you know, if God's going to throw mm-hmm. us a party and do really good things for us at this party, like the Sukkah, he's going to camp out with us. And it's a really good idea to attend. Uh, good things uh, happen if you attend. So if you look at the, the three letters of, uh, of Anna, uh, it's written Ain, Nun, Hey. So the Ain is an I. So be observant. The uh, Nun is, a, uh, is either a sperm or a seed that is germinating. Uh, and then the hey is a person who is observant, looking up and reaching up to God. So it says, you know, pay attention, be focused on not only your own spiritual rebirth, but also your children. And you do that by reaching up and grasping hold of Yah. And so it's a beautiful word. There, there is no negative in the word. And of course, the word on its tertiary, tertiary meaning I don't think it's tertiary, it's probably the fifth or sixth meaning. It has a dark side, which is to afflict. And, of course, the last thing that any rational person would do is to say that God wants us to afflict ourselves on the day of reconciliations. To reconcile is to make the relationship perfect and harmonious. And the last thing you would do is debase your soul on such a day. But religious people are not very smart, and that's how they have twisted it. But as you look at the letters, Kirk, every aspect mm-hmm. of, uh, of Anna, is positive, you know, uh, being observant, Absolutely. being focused, uh, taking the long view, being particularly aware of and caring about our own spiritual rebirth, uh, uh, growing and uh, our own uh, children and family, or just the children of the covenant, and doing so by reaching up and grasping hold of God's hand. So marvelous, marvelous concept. Um, yes, what sir. I wanted to do tonight is start with, and I'll let you carry on from there. You've said two pages of, of notes, Kurt, unless you want to say something now before we uh, we move on. No, I'll just I'll do as all as a group, but that's the there really is you have to work very, very hard to find any any negative connotation to the word Anna. That was the problem yeah. I was having and, and, and even the, the, the one thing I uh can say about it, all the major lexicon writers seem to have the same feeling. They don't really they wait forever to get to the afflict part because they don't really know yes. what to do with it. Yes, so, they, uh, it's they feel obliged to do it because they, uh, they only sell to a religious market. And if the King James mm-hmm. Bible says afflict because yeah. the rabbis said afflict, 
yeah, then what do you do? there you go. Uh, you know, you, you can't, you, you, uh, a Christian just can't help the temptation of having a Jew afflict their soul. So the, <laughs> the, the, the Christian Bible translators were all too eager <laughs> to pick up on a flick. Good. And, uh, yeah, that, hey, well, speaking of, uh, of negative consequences, uh, uh, Leigh and I were talking about uh, uh, the Garden of, uh, of Great Joy, uh, Gan Eden, and we were talking about the consequence for both uh, Chawa and Adam of, uh, of misappropriating and misquoting God's words. And this was not a very good day for uh, uh, Leia, she uh, she started by having to be me today, which means that you know we probably had 20 contractors here today, and every 20 minutes I get up and I walk around and make sure they're all doing what they should be doing, and I answer their questions, and I said, so today you're going to have to be me, and and it goes all day, it goes from 6:30 in the morning to uh, about 6:30 at night, and you know so it takes for a long day, and she's an introvert, so it's not her thing, but I said today, mm-hmm. you know we're a married couple, you have to be me. And uh, so she started uh, downstairs in our uh, uh, in our lower level, um, which is kind of a mess right now. It's a construction zone. Uh, putting it was a guy putting in a new uh, transfer switch. It's really mm-hmm. considered bad form to have your generator come on during a power outage and not cut your supply of power off from the grid. Because if you power the grid and somebody's trying to fix the wires, you will kill them. So that's considered really bad form. Uh, yes, we, yes, one, we, yes. we encourage, we they discourage that. Uh, so she was down there, and she, uh, because while they're doing that, they have the power off. So we have no water because we work on cesspools with pressure pumps and pressure tanks. And so she decided, well, the best thing I could do is just wash my hands in the pool. Asher is a Labrador. You get near the edge of the pool and get down. She is certain that you want to swim, which is the most fun thing in her world. And so she got up behind Leah to uh, to be part of the swimming party and push Leah into the pool. And to be pushed into the pool, fully dressed at 7 o'clock in the morning, that was a tough day. So she was bemoaning, and I don't know how we got to Chawa and Adam, but it is something that I, uh, I, uh, I don't think I've ever considered before. But you know how the five conditions of the covenant are all benefits? We benefit from five and five. Okay, they're not mm-hmm. up the well. They are requirements. There's not a single one of them where we're giving up something that has any value. As a matter of fact, by doing what God asks, our lives are liberated and enriched. So, I said, you know, the penalty. Call it a penalty, if you will, for Adam and Chawa. Their benefits too. So, with uh, Chawa, it was two things. One is that she would uh, give childbirth in pain. And the second is she would be dependent on, reliant, if you will, on her man and sometimes resent that. And for Adam, he was going to toil. He was going to work. So let's look at, and all the women now listening to me say, okay, you've never obviously uh, tried to push out a watermelon from the, you know, the, an orifice the size of a, uh, of a grape. Uh, what are you talking about that's a benefit? Well, every woman that I've ever talked to about having a child forgets about the pain 15 seconds after that beautiful child is first uh, laid on the breast. And that feeling of being a mom and then of, of literally raising a personality that came out of you and them nestling on your breast is so extraordinary that it is actually the gateway to enormous joy. And sometimes when we have to, uh, to endure um, a little um, pain uh, en route to something that is extraordinarily beneficial, it makes that thing all the more grand. So I think that is a benefit. And if you look at the conditions of the covenant, one of those conditions is uh, to trust and rely on Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Too. So what really is the difference? It isn't just being set up as, okay, woman, you're not as strong. You're not going to build as, as big a teepee. You're not going to go out there and bring the rabbit home, uh, uh, much less the wildebeest. Uh, you know, you're not going to cut down the tree for the fire. 
Uh, and when the bad guys come, you aren't strong enough to defeat them by yourself. Mm. You need a man. You just do. And the idea of being reliant on someone who cares about you and is willing to protect you and support you, that was one of the things. You see, I, maybe how we got to this is that Leo was upset that I thought that after pushing the water, I saw some humor in that because she was fully dressed and, and, yeah. you know, and, and making puddles in my office, and it's hard not to see the humor in that. Well, that was a really bad mm. idea. Uh, so yeah, I um, she got, and she got uh, miffed at me, and, and later in the day, I said, let's, let's be fair here. While you reciprocate and sometimes provide even more than I do, the fact of the matter is, I don't think at any time in your life have you been as loved, as supported, as genuinely cared about, as nurtured, as protected by anyone who is as loving and as uh, 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 loyal to you as I am. So, girl, you do not have it bad. This is a pretty good situation that you find yourself in. Mm. Uh, yeah, it may, it may be true that I'm in a better situation. I'm sure it is true that I'm in a better situation than she is. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, by relying on me for those things, protection, support, uh, you know, the basics of life, uh, love, uh, that by relying on me for those things, she's in a better place than she was when she had to be self-reliant. So I look at the two things that Yawa said of Chawa as both being positives. And mm-hmm. Yawa is really clear about our eternity. We are going to work. Yawa works. Yawa helps us work. Yawa values work. We are going to be working in eternity. And if we didn't, how would we grow? Well, how would we contribute anything worthwhile? I mean, there's only so much time you can just sit there and lollygag. After yeah. a while, lollygagging gets to be atrophy. And so we need to work. Working is a tremendous blessing. And so I look at what Yahweh said to Adam and Chawa. It's not only benefits, but benefits that pertain mm-hmm. to the conditions of the covenant. If they were not kicked out, if they were not sent out, sent away, they could never perform the second uh, condition. They Where's couldn't even, to they couldn't even perform you're already the, there. They couldn't even perform the first one. Oh, walk away. You couldn't walk away the first one. Right. Couldn't away they the couldn't even perform yeah. the first one. <laughs> yeah, no, correct, correct. One, one and so, two are really biggies. You know, yeah, they're biggies. Uh, yeah. Right. And what would be the purpose of walking to Yahweh and becoming perfect or trusting and relying upon Yahweh? If you're already, if you're already perfect, yeah. Correct, correct. So it was, a, it was all a benefit for them and even more a benefit for us because it gives us the chance to think it through. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things that has been the greatest reward uh, for me over the last year in fact, I'm mm-hmm. in the midst of writing a chapter where I finally said, you know, I'm just going to own this. Uh, Yahweh laid this all out in Yahshua uh, 11. And if he's going to go to that much trouble to say, all right, this guy may not have any qualifications, so I'm going to give him everything he needs. But by giving him everything he needs, it's going to turn out really good. And so when you just finally said, okay, just own it, get comfortable in it, and all of a sudden – the insights that are useful for our whole family to grow just flow. Mm-hmm. They flow faster than the fingers move over the keyboard. And, and that's one of the great joys of, of doing this. Yeah. So that said, uh, uh, Kirk, what I want to do is I wanted to return to Yashaya 29. I want to pick it up in the sixth statement because it introduces the audience. And then uh, we'll go fairly quickly until we, uh, we reach where we left off the last time, recognizing that without context, Yashaya 29 isn't a sukha chapter. With context, Yashaya 29 is Kapuram leading to sukha, and that is all it is. It says, then, the confusing clamor of the masses and the commotion caused by the disorderly riots and the uproar of agitating protesters Boy, are we seeing that now. Boy, 
you know, yeah, it's prevalent in Israel. It's prevalent around the world. Uh, we exported it from America. Of your arrogant and presumptuous rebels who are boiling over with religious fervor and seething with anger. Now, there's a question here. If it is uh, Zed or Zud, uh, in terms of the way it is written, uh, the great Isaiah sc- scroll has these people being religious, presumptuous and arrogant, as opposed to foreigners. So by saying that, God is saying, you're doing this to yourself. Yes, there's going to be, he's going to bring in the foreigners in a moment, but he wants his people to know that you have done this to yourselves. You really have no one to blame but yourselves. Of your arrogant and presumptuous rebels who are boiling over with religious fervor and seething with anger shall come to be like such from a furnace. (laughs) You've, uh, living in California, particularly recently, you have seen soot from the well. It It does three things. One is it makes it hard to breathe. And breath is nephesh, so it's, it's toxic to the soul. Nephesh mm-hmm. and breath are the same word in Hebrew. Number two, it yes. obscures the light of the sun. Yes. Actually turns it a bloody red. Uh, and yeah. uh, number three, it is very irritating to the eyes. Those are the oh, things that it does. And once the, the soot has been blown away, what is there left of it? Nothing. So all of those people with their religious zeal, who are wearing their religious garb, they shall become like soot from a furnace. Good riddance. Even like chaff, with the confusing clamor of the cruel agitators and the commotion of the disorderly riots of the ruthless protesters, angrily and arrogantly passing through en route to being banished. This shall come to pass suddenly and unexpectedly in an instant. Kirk, if you had asked me to forecast how this could happen in, uh, in just 10 to, uh, to 13 years from now, and yeah, here we are in the early fall mm-hmm. of 2020, I would have said I have no idea. Yeah. But having looked at what is happening around the world, um, over these it's last amazing. three or four months. Oh, it's just amazing. We are yeah. in this place, and we're here early. Yeah. It happened quickly. It happened an, an instantly. And one moment, we were as we had always been, and the next moment, we were as we will continue to be. It says, you will be held accountable by Yahweh, the religious you will be held accountable by Yahweh, the vast array of spiritual implements, through thunderous proclamations. Now, that thunderous proclamation could be Dode, who returns probably on Kaporum with Yahweh. You know, there's mm-hmm. the possibility that Dode even comes to uh, clean up the rubbish, uh, take out the trash, if you will, uh, even before Sukkah. There's that possibility. Uh, mm-hmm. as, I, as I study... Uh, uh, Malak uh, 4 and 5, I don't think that even though Dode is mentioned in, the, in conjunction with there being two witnesses, with one of the witnesses being named, uh, uh, being uh, 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 Elia, um, mm-hmm. and Elia certainly had a, a booming voice, thunderous proclamations. Uh, I, I see that somewhere along the way, that Dode is going to arrive, and while Dode's name is mentioned, it is not mentioned in context with the messengers. I think that the job that Elia is doing and whoever else is palling around with Elia is doing is way beneath Dode. So I don't uh, think Dode is, yeah. is that person, but I think the, he's, those two fellows could got a be, bigger job. Right, yeah. could be ushering. No, yeah, Dode's, Dode's got the ultimate job. Yeah. So, you will be held accountable with Yahweh. Who holds Israel more accountable than Dove? Of the vast array of spiritual implements through thunderous proclamations, with earthquakes and discordant sounds, 
with a great voice. Gadol is the great voice. That is, Gadol and Dode are synonymous terms. With strong, with a strong and raging wind, John, that's the spirit. Hurricane, force winds, tornadoes, in addition to the flames of a devouring fire. God's going to incinerate the trash, which is the best rate. Oh, this is, to minimize this it. This is a new it. story. Yeah. So that's what's going to happen. Yeah, he was coming back to clean up the mess so he can return the earth to the Garden of Eden so we can suka. You know, it's, it's the booming voice is to reconcile the relationship so that the covenant members can suka with Yahweh. This is uh, Yom Kippurim leading to suka. But that is a time and the days leading to it shall be akin to a nightmare with the darkness being exposed, this confusing clamor of the masses and the commotion caused by their disturbing riots and agitating protests. Something we have tried to do in our feeble way is to expose and condemn the world's reaction to COVID, depriving people of the two things God is most desirous of not doing. When you really understand what Yahweh is, is devoted to doing with his people. The first thing is liberty. The second thing yeah, is that, that they have the opportunity to work on their own accord. And what the, the uh, liberal, which means massive use of government, did in response to COVID was deprive people of their liberties and livelihoods. It's the thing that God hates the most. And then, of course, you had the hypocrisy of Black Lives Matter, which pretends that blacks have been systematically harassed by whites and that America is a racist country and that that uh, whites are out hunting down and killing blacks and we need to have racial equality. Well, if we actually had racial equality, blacks would be in a whole world of trouble. There'd be no more affirmative action. Uh, 40% yeah. of, of blacks are on government dole and support versus 10% of Caucasians. That would change as well. And so it would be a tremendous and negative shift getting into college that have to compete yeah. on grades and test yeah. scores. And if you look at the average score of blacks that are admitted to college and Caucasians, it's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, you're looking at the most liberated racial country in the history of the world. And, and of course, as we've said. And, and you know uh, why that is true? You know, where I came from in Orange County for all those years, that was, uh, you see, um, the, um, um, not, yeah, I was going to say San Diego, you, you see Irvine uh, is, they almost have to, uh, do the same thing for Caucasians because the Asians take over so many slots. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't do that if we were racist. It would, it would never work. Oh, you, you, way. If the nation was racist, there would be no affirmative action. If the, if the nation was racist, you wouldn't have wealth redistribution the way that it has been. You know, um, So mm -hmm. uh, the opposite is true. And if the nation was racist, you wouldn't have 93% of the time that a black is murdered. It's at the hands of another black. Mm -hmm. So that's just the uh, the reality of it. So, and it shall be akin to a nightmare with the darkness being exposed, uh, this confusing clamor of the masses and the commotion caused by their disturbing riots and agitating protests from all of the Gentiles in their nations. Now, what I said is that God is an equal opportunity hater. If you're going to be political, militant, and religious, if you're going to do something that's harmful to his people, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, or socialist secular humanism and academia, if you're going to do something that is harmful to his people, Yisrael and Yahuda, God's going to hold you accountable. You're in his sight. It does not matter. Yeah. In that case, if you're bad and Jewish, or you're bad and a Gentile. So he's already mm -hmm. uh, lashed out at the uh, Jews who are religious and said, I'm going to hold you accountable. Now he's saying, with all those Gentiles who have come to fight, that have come to Ha Saba over and against the Lion of God, 
and those gathered by God, Ariel. Um, their fate is to be extinguished by God, incinerated. This includes all who battle against her. And goes on to say that those who fight with her over the constructions of walls and barricades and who deliberately distress and harass her, seeking to constrain and narrow her. God is telling us that he is aware of the movement in academia, in politics, in religion, to sever Israel at the waist, to narrow her to an undefensible strip of land, to have her tear down her walls that keep the terrorists at bay, which will make her indefensible, and oh well, that will cause the terrorists to do what the Nazis did when Neville Chamberlain gave them the high ground of Czechoslovakia. God is telling us this is going to happen, and that it is really upsetting him, and that those Mm -hmm. who are pursuing this agenda are toast, literally, like soot from a fire. And it will be like when, and this is the thing that we we, uh, talked about, I'll go through this quickly, but it's like when someone dreams of growing physically stronger and then envisions uh, himself uh, eating, but is aroused from his sleep and is uh, not satisfied by his his, uh, fantasy, it can be compared to when a thirsty individual dreams of recovering, and then he envisions himself drinking but uh, awakened. He, is, uh, he notices he is weakened and needs to recuperate, uh, and his soul is unsettled and suddenly anxious and longing. This, there's this sense of denial where Jews will say, you know, let's give peace a chance. Yeah, what peace of Israel do you want to give a chance to? A chance that it will be destroyed with all the Jews on it killed. Who in their right mind would trust a two-state solution when a one-state is indefensible? Who in their right mind would, would actually acknowledge the existence of a Palestinian when there hasn't been a Palestinian for 2,500 years? Yeah. Who in the world is going to believe Hadrian's lie that there's a place called Palestine? When God calls it Yisrael. Uh, so we have, particularly among Jews, this uh, sense of we'll wake up tomorrow and it, it somehow will be better. But God is saying, no, it won't be. And I, I saw a movie the other day. It was about a, a woman that uh, went to live in Nazi occupied France. And, then saw the Nazis haul away young children, uh, put them in trains and kill them. And, and, you know, when you see something like that, hate is the, uh, is the first response. And, you know, if you could go back and murder the Nazis that did that and the French collaborators, I, I would, to protect the, uh, the children. Um, mm-hmm. And, in fact, I would even go back, given the opportunity, and see to it that those who collaborated with them are, uh, are punished by uh, eternal uh, incarceration or death. Uh, it, it just can't sit by idly and allow that to happen. But the, they all thought it was going to go away. And one of the things that was so troubling is how the Nazis and their collaborators always knew where to show up. They knocked on specific doors and called out mm-hmm. specific names and waited for those specific people to come out into the, uh, the street and didn't live, leave without all of them. How did they know? And of course, the answer is IBM. We all know now. Yeah. Yeah, IBM. Yes. IBM gave them that information. An American company, God, is going to hold them accountable. So it shall be with the multitude of confused protesters and enraged rioters of the Gentiles and their nations that have come to wage war over Mount Zion. This is where it's going to be. God is going to incinerate them. Consider the consequence, and of your own volition, avoid allowing any societal influence 
to persuade you to linger because you will be astonished and bewildered. Of your own initiative, choose to close your eyes and shield your vision. Drink it in and you will become intoxicated, but not from wine. You may be shaken and stumble, but not with fear. That's the reason I wanted to go back to Yeshaya 29. Six. Mm-hmm. We live in a time where if you watch the news, whether it's the forest fires in California, it's, it's the people clamoring to support the hypocrisy of the conspiracy called Black Lives Matter. If it's the, uh, the deprivation of liberty and livelihood by the COVID response, which every aspect of it is just a series of lies built on top of lies, built on top of deception and nothing but fear mongering. And most people that get it are like the uh, the president now. He's got it and has no symptoms. And uh, if, uh, 80% of those who are young and get it don't even know they have it. Uh, but this is, is not yeah. the monster that we have made it up to be. In fact, only about 4% of those who die uh, and are attributed to a COVID death actually die of COVID. About 4%. So God's saying, think it's that high? yeah, well, no, because I it was I, 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 because yeah, they credit well, so much. If you have COVID, yet you die of COVID, no matter what you died from. Yeah, so you have yeah. The CDC attack, says right? that uh, that only four percent, four to six percent of those who are mm-hmm. classified as having died of COVID are actually actually died of COVID. They, uh, on average, they had three other uh, deadly diseases at the time. And according to uh, the British research, 66% of them would have died within the year. Uh, we have made a monster of, of, of a little virus, scared as we are, willing to inappropriately give up our freedoms and our livelihoods, destroy our economy and our currency. Therefore, Yahweh will pour out for a time upon you a spirit of diminished consciousness. He will close your eyes with regard to the prophets. And this is precisely what's happened. There are rabbis who study Yahweh's Torah and then try to twist it into their own arguments uh, uh, through the Talmud. And of course, Jews who claim to be Torah observant are not. They're Talmud observant. Um, But if you were to go through the prophecies, for example, in Yahshua, from beginning to end, they're clueless, absolutely clueless. It's a dim- diminished consciousness. And the reason that I put the translation of Yahshua 29 into the prologue of the first volume of the first book is because I wanted people to have the answer, particularly Jews, to this question. Why is it that a dumb Gentile is translating Hebrew and interpreting it for me. Why is that? Why isn't it a Hebrew scholar? Why isn't it a fellow Jew? Why isn't it a Hebrew, uh, somebody who has you know, been educated in the nuances of Hebrew and somebody who is religious? Why is it that it's a goyim without any credential? Mm-hmm. This is the answer. Yeah, he told you. Yeah, he told you. And withdrawal. It's because I ain't your you. own people have a diminished consciousness and, they're, and have been blinded with regard to the prophets. They don't get it. They do not understand. They just do not understand what Yahshua Yah said. They don't understand what Yerma Yah said. They don't understand what Malachi said. You know, they make so many stupid rules in Judaism, you, you could spend a thousand years just going over the stupidity of it. They, they're blinded to it. And we talked last week, why would God do that? Because he had no choice. If God allowed these despicable religious people to understand the prophets and weave that understanding into their Talmud and Zohar arguments and their Mishnah, then the number of people they would mislead would be 
astronomically higher. Now, right now, you have to be a dunderhead to be an Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. Today, you have to be ignorant and or irrational to be a Christian. Today, you just have to be flat out stupid to be a Muslim. The Quran is the <laughs> dumbest book ever written by any standard. It's, it's immoral from, and plagiarized and twisted and bastardized and, and inconsistent and inaccurate. and It's just disgusting. The dumbest book ever written. And to attribute that to God, you have to say that God is dumber, even a retarded man. And, you know, you read Paul's drivel. He contradicts himself constantly. He claims that he, he is speaking for uh, God, and then... He annuls everything that God said. I mean, you just have to be stupid. He bases it on replacement theology when every end time prophecy like this one is focused on Israel. How can there be a church that replaced Israel if all of the end time prophecies are focused on Israel? How can God have said, I'm going to replace the Torah, and I want to call this thing called a New Testament, if the means to reconciliation and exuberant life throughout eternity is the inscription of his Torah inside of us. It's just so stupid, it hurts. And so religion now is for ignorant people who just want to go along. They, they join it because most religions allow men to, uh, to lord over women and take advantage of them. Uh, it, uh, women get the Stockholm Syndrome, so they end up going along with it, even though they're abused in every possible way. And so what you have is a cult of the ignorant and irrational. So stupid. But what if those who are promoting religions understood what we, under, what we know about Yahweh? What if they were making intelligent, rational persuasive arguments on behalf of the covenant, on behalf of Yahweh's name? What if they were actually using Yahweh's name, and then we were to come out and say, oh, by the way, God's name is Yahweh. He hates religion, when all of those who are promoting religion were using Yahweh's name. They would associate yeah. and say Yahweh's name with their goddamn religion. So God said, mm -hmm. no, I'm blind. Okay. It's, all, it's what he had to do. For the truth yeah, I never life. considered that when you when I read it. I, I, that was the first time I considered it by listening to him. Going, wow, that's absolutely true. They could twist it better. Than, they could twist it like uh, Satan did in the garden. Yes, and it would be incredible. And it would be. It's one thing for us to say that Yahweh has seven Moed Mikre and use those terms, which Jews don't really use, mm -hmm. and that each one of yeah. them uh, provides access to us living in Yahweh's presence, and that they fulfill the promises of the uh, covenant, and that these things are related, and they are all from Yahweh, as prescribed in his Torah, which, by the way, means teaching and guidance, not law. If religious Christians and Jews and or Muslims were saying the same thing and then taking a point of departure from that, it would be much more difficult for us to differentiate the truth about Yahweh from the religious drivel. Right now, it's black and white. It's easy. You got light and you have darkness. You have uh, life and you have death. It is exceedingly clear. And it would not be this way if Yahweh had not blinded the religious leadership regarding the prophets. They don't know what's coming. They don't even know when it's coming. Heck, they don't even know that their Messiah is named and that he's returning. They didn't, weren't even smart enough to recognize that Yosha was the Passover lamb. They weren't smart enough to realize that when Christians said, this is the Christ, the Messiah, you say, are you idiots? Yahweh said that Dod is the Messiah, and he said, hey, if that ain't true, you can call me a liar. Are you calling God a liar? How hard would it have been? Or when they said, you killed God, you killed Jesus, to say, well, 
if we delivered the Passover lamb to fulfill the lamb's Passover responsibility, you ought to be thanking us. Yeah, pat me on the back. Yeah. And concerning your leadership, he has withdrawn the ability to receive or communicate messages from God as prophets. Chose that. Any association with the agreement or ability to be inspired or be perceptive. So, you want to know why it's not a rabbi that's telling you this? God just explained it. Yashaya 29. So, is it humiliating for the chosen people to have to get this message from a lowly goyim? Damn right. But you made your bed. Now you know why. God specifically made it impossible for rabbis to know the truth because he knew what they would do with it and how corrupting it would be. And so he withdrew from Israel as it comes to communicating his messages. Withdrew from them. After Malachi, there would be no more. None. You can't call wow. Yosha a prophet because we don't have a single word he said recorded by him in the language he spoke. Not one. Yeah. You can't call Yahu Khanan a prophet because he doesn't write like a prophet. All the prophets say Yahweh's name constantly. They write in Hebrew. They said, Yahweh said. And they speak, they communicate Yahweh's message in first person. There isn't a hint of that in Yahweh Khanan. And of course, the rest of them are all pals of Paul and thus inspired by the devil. So... <laughs> There hasn't been, and there will not be, any Yehuda who speaks on behalf of Yahweh until Dod returns or until Elia becomes a witness. And even then, when Elia becomes a witness, I don't know this for certain. I, I think it's the case. But Elia is going to be there to lambaste religious Jews and political Jews. He's going to do what he has always done, speak against Jewish religions. Uh, I think he's going to have uh, an unnamed person at his side. And the reason that you always see the other person unnamed is because the name of the other person is irrelevant, would not have made any difference to anyone, and that other person is going to be the one that exposes and condemns Islam, Christianity, and socialist secular humanism. But there will not be, other than Elia and then followed by Dode, and that is not until we are in the, the depths of the time of Jacob's trouble, that there will be a Jew doing this. Yahweh yeah, was really clear, um, particularly when Solomon gave his speech at the dedication of the temple, saying it would be an anchor, an observant for him. Did they just not hear that, that no one's ever made a comment about that? What? I find did that Yawa just unbelievable. Just Kirk? That is just Kirk? right in your face. Kirk? I know. What did Yahweh just say? Just, what did Yahweh just, just say? He just said that she he said, I blinded, you, I blinded you to the prophet. Right? I have so. Yeah. Yes. When Yahweh says, but, I have wow. blinded my people to the prophets, Boy. chances are he means, Good. I blinded my people to the prophets. Yeah. And yeah. then he says that my people are not going to speak for me. That probably means that Yisraelites and Yehudim are not going to be speaking for God. That means if God's going to be consistent and speak through his creation, pick somebody for some reason that that makes sense to him, uh, then he has only one choice. If he's not going to speak to his his people, that's what he just said. It's got to be a good one. That's all that's left. You know, it's either, either we've got to get Asher here to be far more energetic, or it's a goy. That's just the way it is. So this is in the, uh, the, uh, is in the prelude to uh, uh, Yada Yawa. Um, uh, it's the prelude chapter is called Prophecy, uh, Future History. And it's there because... Um, it's important for the target audience, Yahweh's target audience, Yehudim Jews. 
yeah. to recognize why their own people are incapable of revealing this message. Yeah, yeah, the Jews have long sought to spoke for G-D, for Hashem. And they've probably done a really good job of communicating the message of G-D and of Hashem. Hashem. It's just they're clueless about Yahweh. Amazing. When to reveal the way the book is placed before someone in an effort to become aware and understand, they will say, please read this. <laughs> but he will answer, I am, I am unable to comprehend it because it is sealed. For his people, God wants you to know, it's not just they have been blinded to the prophet when Yahweh's written testimony is placed before them for the purpose of yada. And that says yada right here. And an effort mm-hmm. to yada, to know what was revealed by yada, they will say, please read this. But he will answer, I'm unable to comprehend it because it is sealed. Now, that happens to be a significant clue that an effort to become aware and understand, yada, they will say, please. And he will say, no, I'm unable to comprehend it because it is sealed. And should they give the book to someone who is ignorant and illiterate and who cannot understand what was written? This is Al-Asher Loyada Shefer asking, please read it. He will reply, I am clueless and cannot read the written words. Now, that's really telling, too, because what is the difference between the Talmud and and Jewish mythology and the Torah? One thing. What is the difference? One of them is the Talmud. The Talmud is oral. It's an argument against. It's oral. Oh, yes, yes, it's oral law. The yes, Talmud the is like oral. Point. It's the oral traditions. Yes. Written the Torah the is written. The prophets are all written. God constantly says, saying to Moshe, to Dod, to his prophets, write this down. Yahweh's testimony is always written. Yes. Talmud is the oral testimony of the religious. So he didn't say, hey, you won't be able to hear what they say. Oh, you can hear what they say. Just fine. But when it comes to the written testimony, whether it's these books, which translate and, and analyze Yahweh's words, or it's you read it? uh, yeah, the Torah itself, they're saying, hey, no, 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 I'm clueless. Yeah. Lo yada. By the way, yada is twice in this statement. Three times, eh? I'll ask you. Well, it's in the previous statement. And then it is twice in his name. Uh, he will say, I'm clueless okay. as it relates to Yada. I'm just clueless. I do not understand Yada. I'm clueless when it comes to Yada. Now, listen, for anybody that's saying, yeah, that's, that's, you know, yeah, you're feeling pretty sure of yourself by pointing out that, uh, that it's Yada. And, and, of course, the, all these books are Yada Yawa and that you wrote mm-hmm. them for the first 15 years under the name Yada, you're feeling Yada, pretty clear yeah. yourself to, to somehow refer to uh, that being something regarding what you're doing. Don't see it that way. You know? you're, you're free yeah. to not see it that way, but understand yeah. that if it isn't from what Yada is providing here, where are you going to get it? Because God just said, yeah. Those that speak Hebrew, those who study Hebrew, those who are Jews are not going to speak for him. They are not going to comprehend. And so if it ain't Yada, who's it who is it? Who's your pick? Come yeah. up yeah, come up with a come up with another alternative. And once you say, Okay, well, it probably is Yada, uh, you know, realize to be chosen by Yah to do something 
is you're not chosen because you have a credential that would impress anyone. Yah chooses people who are broken, who are flawed. I know I like to say that most of the people God chooses are rascals. They're lovable rogues. And mm-hmm. and like okay, tonight, you know, I'm operating on ten percent of my capacity. I'm in well, with, with, with the uh, with the fever. I ache from head to toe, and I'm nauseous. And guess what? Still, Yah was able to inspire what we have to say. Yeah. Yahweh works through flawed implements. He's really good at it. In fact, if he wasn't, there'd be no one to work with. So it it isn't a honor that you can say, look at me, I'm proud, look what I've done. Uh, Yahweh is doing this for me. Everybody that takes that approach is completely missing it. You're chosen because you are inadequate. And by being inadequate, you're willing to acknowledge it and be reliant. So the number one criterion for being chosen is to be incompetent. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, I will tell you, it's also to be funny. willing, but, but the number one criterion is to be incompetent. So if you think yeah. that's something you would aspire to. That's pretty damn it. Yeah. Come, on, come on in. <laughs> that, that was lousy myself. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm so perfectly easy. situated. <laughs> suited for that. <laughs> then Yahweh said, and this is something that we've made a big deal over. Then Yahweh said, indeed, for as much as these people, he's talking about the rabbis, approach me and those influenced by the rabbis with their mouths and with their lip service. Oh, my God, did they do that? It's just oh, revolting. Yeah. You just yeah. see them and you, you, hmm. you know, I'm nauseous today, so I don't want to say the, the word vomit. But, no, don't but say, no, that's, what, that's what you want to do. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, putting on airs. Oh, my God, did they put on airs. Playing religion. They avoid exercising good judgment. They have removed their hearts and distanced themselves from me. As a result, the fear of me exists as a condition of men which is taught. Fear the Lord. Yes. And Yahweh's whole presentation is covenant family. Himself as both father and mother, and listen, I know what it's like to fear my father. I had a really lousy father, and my mother acquiesced to my father because she was scared. And so, you know, I didn't have the world's best upbringing. Turned out to be wonderful because if you could overcome it, you develop character. And and my situation is not unique. I think most people have had uh, problems. Uh, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Most people. Have. Uh, and if they haven't had problems, problems with their parents, they've had problems with their children, they have no problems with their children, they have uh, problems with siblings. Uh, if they have no problems with their siblings, they have problems with their uh, their spouses. I, I happen to uh, have the trifecta. Uh, and so but, but that is what we should expect. That's what Moshe yeah. endured. That's what Dode endured. If, if those fellows endured it, you know you're going to endure it because it's helpful. It's beneficial. If you don't know what it's like to have someone you care about that you have made sacrifices for, you have brought into your home and you have supported, turn on you, then how in the world are you going to know what Yahweh's endured? Yeah. And so, you know, what did Yahweh do with Hosha? He said, I want you to go out and marry a temple prostitute. That way you'll know what it's like for me exactly. to be with the Israelites who are out Screwing around with false gods. He wants empathy. Why was it that the greatest of the prophets, uh, I know that Yahweh says that Moshe was the greatest of the prophets, and went on to say he was the greatest of those who speak for me because all the, the great things that he did leading my people out of, of, uh, of Egypt. But Mitzrayim, in terms yeah. of first prophecy, the greatest of the prophets is clearly Yahshua. And mm-hmm. with Yahshua, how many people did Yahshua have listened to him during his lifetime? Zip. Zero. Zero. So for him to empathize with what it's like to be Yahweh and have no one listen to what he had to say over lifetimes, the best way for him to do that was to be completely stymied by the people he was speaking to. That way you know. You, you can speak with passion because you've lived it. Why was Dode such a, an effective communicator? Because he felt the joys and the pain 
of life. So, then Yahweh said, indeed, for as much as these people approach me with their mouths and with their lip service, putting on air, they avoid exercising good judgment, and they remove their hearts uh, and have distanced themselves from me. That is something we have attempted and been devoted to doing the opposite. One of the things that we've learned is that you approach Yahweh through evidence and reason. The evidence comes by way of his testimony. Reason is using our nasama such that we consider what we think he has to say, and you make the connections necessary based upon what he has conveyed to understand. It's all about evidence and reason. And as a result, rather than the fear of Yahweh, we teach reverence and respect for Yahweh because he is our father. It is key to understanding that Yahweh is beloved, that Yahweh is committed to getting down on his knees to lift us up. Yahweh calls himself our helper, our assistant. Isn't that that amazing? And and when you you get into the mode, which so many of us are doing now uh, in the covenant family, to working Mm -hmm. on behalf of Yahweh, what you find is that he does all of the heavy lifting. It's a real pleasure. Therefore, behold, as for me, I will once again at another time approach and do wonderful things with the people who are closely related, with surprising fulfillments and inspiring signs, along with that which is marvelous and miraculous. It's the first half of Yahshua 29.14. That's it, okay. That's the people. That's the Gentiles. That's the uh, religious Jews. They're disgusting. I'm going to uh, dumb them down. I'm going to blind them. I'm going to seal the prophets. Uh, I'm going to keep them from understanding what is uh, what I have written so they don't corrupt people and create a credible uh, uh, religion. And, and then I'm going to annihilate uh, those upon my return. But as for me, as for me, I'm not like them. I will yet again at another time approach and do wonderful things with the people who are closely related. Eth ha am ha zeh, with the family, with those who are related through the agreement with Yisrael, with Yahuda with surprising fulfillments and inspiring signs, along with that which is marvelous and miraculous. Whether he is talking about the fulfillment of Pesach, Matzah, Bechotim, the fulfillment of Shavuah, the future fulfillment of Teruah, which Mm -hmm. for for a very large extent, the moment we started this, we engaged in the literal fulfillment of Teruah. Our lives are Teruah. And I understand that. it's all designed for sukkah, excuse me, yeah, for sukkah, by way of, mm-hmm. of Kippurim to reconcile Yisrael and Yahuda with Yahweh so that we can all camp out together. Those are the inspiring fulfillments. And then the wisdom of the techni- and the technical acumen of their scholars and theologians of their shred uh, and technically shrewd, I should say, and, uh, mm-hmm. and technically uh, trained, um, as well as those who claim to be learned, learned and wise, in addition to the discernment and understanding of their most educated teachers, shall all vanish, ceasing to exist. There will be no Zohar. There will be no Talmud. There will be no Mishnah, and there will be no bobbing heads in religious garb citing prayers from them. No rabbinical arguments. It will all vanish. And more than any people in history, Jews have relied on their educated teachers. Jews have been hoodwinked into believing that a non-technically trained, a non-ordained rabbi is capable of communicating anything from the Torah. 
that if you want to know the Torah, you cannot read it yourself, because I guess God's a really crappy communicator, and that the only way that you can benefit from anything God had to say is to have it filtered by one of these educated teachers. They've all been taught that over and over again. And if you step out of line and say, no, no, that's not true, even though you're decoding Yahweh and Yahshua to say it, oh, you are absolutely harassed and crucified by the Jewish religious establishment. That's what they have hoodwinked the people into believing. And Yahweh is saying, no, it's just the opposite. They're the ones who are going to be silenced. They will not silence those who speak for me. It is them who will be silenced. So this is a warning. Woe to those who lack understanding and who have become profoundly difficult with regard to Yahweh. Your counsel and your schemes will no longer be known. Those whose undertaking they have tried to conceal in the dark will say, who will see us? And why will we be exposed? Who actually knows and genuinely understands the nature of our actions? Elia, Dote, so many of us in the covenant family now, anyone who reads the prophets, they will understand Mm -hmm. The horrid nature of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all products of Jews. Great, too. And so what they have conspired to do will be exposed. And they say, oh, no, no, we'll never be exposed. No, who actually knows and genuinely understands the nature of our actions? Well, that was the purpose of these rewrites of observations and coming home and now of yada, yada is to expose them. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do know. You know, we exposed Paul in questioning Paul. We exposed Muhammad in Prophet of Doom. Mm -hmm. And now we're exposing uh, Judaism. Rabbis, yeah. Yeah, rabbis. Yeah, yeah, and observations and in covered home. Your perversions have inverted reality, having turned things upside down by claiming the opposite of what is actually true. You know that religious Jews don't uh, teach there is no hell. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm course they, I'm of course they know. I've heard that. Yeah. They, they have no means to keep anyone out of it. And of course, all the religious leaders are headed to it. <laughs> of course they do. And of course, God. they say that God doesn't have a name. His name is the name. And of course, they uh, uh, they want uh, the people to obey them, and God doesn't even have a word for obey. Hmm. They establish laws, and Torah means God doesn't he has teaching. Yeah, well, yep. yeah, establish uh, the Cohen priests to mm-hmm. serve as intermediaries uh, and interpreters of the Mikra. So the people would be able to benefit by understanding their purpose. And he established the Shaphat judges for the purpose of making decisions should there be disputes on the Torah. Yeah, right. And there's no no, uh, territory cut off for rabbis. As a matter of fact, the rabbi is based upon rabbi. Don't use that name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all good one. Basis of rabbi is all over the Torah prophets. It means those who are exalted. Mm-hmm. God's not into exalting. Listen, you know, we've been talking about Yahweh working through us because you know, we were the least qualified, which made us qualified. Uh, the moment that you think that you're special, that you're ex- uh, exalted, that you're bringing something really valuable to God that he couldn't get anyplace else, that only you can tell people what God is saying, you are a rabbi and you are become his enemy. Don't do that. Oh, wow. Good point. Good point. Yeah. It is comparable to the potter's clay, continually reckoning and regarding itself such that it should claim of the one who designed and fabricated it. <laughs> he didn't make me. Or should the thing conceived and created of those of the one who is formed say, he is the one without knowledge or understanding? Well, that was basically what uh, Rabbi Akiva, who may not even have been Jewish, mm-hmm. by the way, 
uh, and got to the position by marrying into a, a wealthy family and then uh, using his wife's connections uh, and a power grab. Uh, and of course, is best known for uh, for his uh, uh, acceptance of a false messiah. So he had a false messiah, mm-hmm. and that false messiah caused the diaspora and uh, and Jews to be dispersed as slaves around the the world and be booted out of their homeland so they could be tormented by Roman Catholics and Christians and now Muslims for uh, for a couple of thousand years. You would think that would be the least credible person to be the father of your religion. So when I say that religious Jews are stupid, to have Rabbi Akiba be the father of your religion with all that he did that was wrong and counter to you, you have to be stupid. And his deal was, listen, Yah was into free will. That means there should be a vote. And if there are a half a dozen rabbis and they differ uh, from what Yah was does, but they agree with one another, which by the way, it seldom occurs, uh, then their determination supersedes Yahweh. I guess, tell you what, if you were to take uh, a million Kirks, and a million Kirks were all to say that Yahweh's name is really Baal, it would make it true. All of mankind's intelligence combined does not even measure to up to navel length by comparison to Yah. Yah was the one with knowledge and understanding. If we want it, we have to go to him. Steady, you already said. Yep. Whether or not it will take a while before in a relatively short and subsequent period of time, a few individuals will return and they will be restored. It will be determined that they are white, approaching a fruitful garden filled with trees. So God is saying, listen, I'm, uh, I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take. I'm uh, not going to uh, tell you how many it's going to be. But there will be a relatively short period of time, a subsequent period of time, and very few individuals. They're going to return, and they're going to be restored. It will be determined that they are white, Lebanon. Now, I understand that Chesed Lebanon is saying that they translate Chesab as something other than uh, credited and considered, but Chesab is an accounting term. It means to determine, to credit, to acknowledge, to consider. And Lebanon is is Laban, which means white and purified, with the own uh, suffix. The own suffix is like Shabbaton. Shabbaton is all things related to the Shabbat. There are a number of owns in the Iowa's testimony. So this means Lebanon. You can just translate and say it'll be determined that they are Lebanon. What? No, it's going to be determined that they are purified and radiant white when approaching the fruit of the of the trees. That's the whole purpose of the set-apart spirit. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, that doesn't work very well for the black Hebrew Israelites. <laughs> no, no, that's a good point. But nothing else has worked very well for them. <laughs> there you go. No, <laughs> whatever. No, uh, <laughs> So in that day, the deaf shall hear, and they shall listen to the words of this book. However, wow. they're out. Wow. It will be away it. from the shadows, the dysfunctional nature and spiritual unreceptivity of the darkness and ignorance that the eyes of the blind shall choose to see now and forevermore. So... Whether or not Yahweh is speaking of uh, the book that Yeshayah is reading uh, or writing, it could be. It could be that, that there will become a time that this Yeshayah 29 will be appreciated and understood by uh, Yehuda. I hope so. Is it the possibility, since most Jews speak English, that they will read this translation of Yeshayah's book? And come to know Yahweh this way? That's also very possible. 
whether this book is is the prelude to Yada Yawa and Yawa's testimony as it is translated and presented therein, or it's just they learn to uh, read Hebrew and they translate really what is considered Mesoretic Hebrew back into its uh, original form. Mm-hmm. Either way, it's fine. It's the same message, right? Yes. Same exact Absolutely. message, same God. And thereafter, it will be away from the shadows, the dysfunctional nature of spiritual unreceptivity, away from the darkness and ignorance that the eyes of the blind will choose to see now and forevermore. That is where we are headed. So in that day, the deaf, those who have been cut into the agreement based upon that which has been inscribed shall hear, and they will listen to the words of a book. Thereafter, it will be away from the shadows and the dysfunctional nature of spiritual and receptivity of darkness and ignorance that the eyes of the blind will now choose to see. As we turn to Yeshaya 29.19, it reads, Those who answer and respond, the straightforward and unpretentious, that's what God likes. Don't blow smoke. Mm-hmm. Don't approach with airs. Be straightforward. Be unpretentious. Without Hebrew, right? hubris. Uh, that happens to be ana, uh, A-N-A-W, as opposed to ana, but guess what it's based upon? shall be enriched exponentially by Yahweh, becoming jubilant. It is the garden of great joy, after all, and that's where we are headed. But those who answer and respond, who are straightforward and unpretentious, shall be enriched exponentially, Yahweh, shall be enhanced and enlightened, increased in every possible way by Yahweh becoming jubilant. I think that Yahweh is going to take us from three-dimensional to seven. I think he's going to give us the capacity to explore a six-dimensional universe. I think we're going to be beautifully enlightened with the Torah written inside of us. I think we are going to be enriched by inheriting everything Yahweh has to give. We'll be tremendously empowered. The, each time we step up in dimensional capacity, we are increased infinitely. So this is infinity times infinity times infinity times infinity. Those who have willingly eschewed political power, it's not very often you get to use eschewed. No, eschewed. It's kind of a good word, but those who have <laughs> willingly eschewed, forsaken, done away with, political power, uh, disassociated from, political power, making themselves subject to criticism and abuse because, boy, if you speak out against politics or patriotism Mm -hmm. or militarism or honoring, you know, the the fallen soldiers, uh, you are going to be criticized and abused. Those who live apart from the religious establishment and have limited societal status, those who are opposed and disregarded, who are are opposed and are disregarded based upon their choices. Among humankind, in association with the set-apart one of Yisrael, shall rejoice over their favorable outcome. Who is the set-apart one of Yisrael, according to Yahweh? God. Correct. He is the set-apart one of Yisrael. So, those who have disassociated from politics and religion among humankind, the sons of Adam, in association with Dode, based upon understanding that Dode is the Messiah, the King of Kings, that he is the shepherd, that he is the chosen one, that he is the son of God, that he is an acclaimed prophet, the embodiment of the covenant, those who approach Yahweh after walking away from religion and, po- and politics in concert with Dod, the set-apart one of Israel, 
shall rejoice over their favorable outcome. I don't think it's actually possible to have a full appreciation of the purpose of the Torah, of the benefit of the covenant, of what Yahweh is offering mm-hmm. without listening to Dode, without listening to what Yahweh has to say about Dode. You learn it's so relaxing because Dode had so many flaws, and yet Yahweh said, he's perfect. He's my guy. He's, right. yeah. he's my guy. He is my guy. I love him. I named him Love. Yeah. I anointed him. I chose him. Uh, he's my guy. And when you know that Dode is Yahweh's favorite person and you study Dode's life and you read what he uh, had to say, you can relax. You really can. You can say, well, I can do that. I can be like that. That's no. absolutely true. I don't want to follow the Passover lamb, but I'll sure as heck follow the shepherd. Yeah, I can't do what Moshe did either, but I can't. This is yeah, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I you know. Uh, can you imagine herding you, uh, you for 40 years through the <laughs> desert? <laughs> Try to round up uh, cats. Yeah. Give it a shot. Uh, it, this thing kind of went exponential, I thought, a couple of years ago when you started going heavily, heavily, heavily into Yashia. I mean, we've been in Yashia a long time now. and But uh, also uh, then the passages on Dode, it was like, uh, bam, it's just... Yeah, change, exponential change knowledge. Perspective. Just and yeah. change, it changed. Of course, it made you have a heck of a lot of rewrites, but all it's the better. Uh, I mean, and get it. Yeah, all the better. But uh, wow. yeah, but yeah. Learn. But yeah. my goodness, this is yeah. so. Those who answer what a journey, long, straightforward and unpretentious, shall be enriched exponentially by Yahweh, becoming jubilant. Those have, who have willingly eschewed political and religious power, making themselves subject to criticism and abuse. Among humankind, the sons of Adam, in association with the set apart one of Yisrael, shall rejoice over their favorable outcome. Why, it's Dode coming back to clean house Mm -hmm. to protect his people. So if you're with Dode, you get to live uh, in the presence of the great shepherd and Messiah and king and Yisrael with Yahweh. If you are not in association with Dode, Goodbye. You're in trouble. Oh, and you know the Jews will say, "Oh, but we are the uh, symbol of Israel, the Star of David." We got two problems with that. <laughs> no. One of them is rabbis. It ain't, it ain't David. Well, yeah, the uh, rabbis don't associate with Israel. They don't have no. any association with the nation of Israel. They associate with Yahudim, Jews. It's Judaism, not Israelism. A huge difference. It is Judaism. They focus on being Jewish and of, of controlling those who are Jewish. It's not the nation. The second is the star of David was not conceived until sometime around the 14th century. And even then, it was imposed on Jews as a sign of this marks their ghetto. Mm-hmm. This is where they must be. The Jews actually designed it. They're always their worst enemy. It is, it is six, the number of man, phallic symbols mm-hmm. surrounding a vagina. That is what it says in the Zohar. That is where it came from. I can guarantee you that Yahweh's man, Dode, does not have a star. It was Akiba that had a star. It was Bar Kokhba son of the star, that he promoted as the Messiah. There is no star of David. It is a disgusting symbol of paganism. And it comes from the Zohar, from Kabbalah. And it is man's phallus around a woman's vagina. That is its basis. Then indeed, the ruthless terrorists will fail. They will be stopped. And then they will vanish. Those who ridicule and mock will be gone. And then all of those who do not hesitate when it comes to that which is corrupt and damaging to the relationship, they shall be cut off and separated from those in the covenant. Islamic terrorists are clear. Mm -hmm. They will fail. They will vanish. Israel will no longer be tormented because their great defender 
will be on the job. And Dode does not allow anyone to harm his people. He was great at that. Those who ridicule and mock, huh, Dode will incinerate. Coming back is brilliant as the sun, after all. This is not going to be the Dode with a, uh, the eight-year-old with the slingshot. Okay, this is Dode as light. This is Dode who will have enormous power. Then all of those who do not hesitate, and even then, Yahweh is working through his creation. This is the grand mm -hmm. moment when Yahweh returns in, in power and glory. And what does he do? Even then, he works through his creation. Now, in this case, he works through the best of his creation, and he empowers him just a wee little bit. As just a matter of fact, bad. Yahweh says the dode will be as God. As now, light. By the way, like him. so will we. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? And we are taken wow. to six and seven dimensional beings. As God said, you're going to be uh, enormously enriched and empowered. We're going to be as God. Because we're going to be the sons and daughters of God. And so we will be as well. But uh, Dode's still special. Those who ridicule and mock will all be gone. And all those who do not hesitate when it comes to that which is corrupt and damaging to the relationship shall be cut off and separated from those in the covenant. So, you know, there's a lot of people who claim to be covenant, and yet they uh, say damaging and corrupt things. Many of them are, are still promoting their conspiracies. Uh, many of them are, mm -hmm. uh, are condemning us. Uh, they don't condemn us. They oh, condemn yeah. me, and they say you're just the... the the best uh, and greatest guy in the history of, uh, of mankind. So they love you. But they don't like me very much. Don't, don't, uh, let, me, don't let me tell me. Yeah, you know, it kind of goes with the territory, so though. You know, I don't uh, think that they, uh, the folks liked uh, Yasha Yah very much uh, either. And, you know, Dode uh, had the people turn on him. So, you know, you've got good company. None. People turn on you for for casting your lot in with, uh, with you. Anyway, those who are, are opposed to, uh, to those in the covenant, yeah, you're toast. Goodbye. Dode will take care of that. Those who have caused a man to be excluded from the relationship by missing the way through their words. And for those who argue, trying to prove their case within the doorway of public meeting places so as to mischaracterize or falsify and wrongly convict they promote and disseminate that which misleads and thrusts aside, devaluing and negating, even confusing and convoluting that which is right. Oh boy, God does not take kindly to misappropriating his words, to misquoting his words, to mischaracterizing his words, to falsifying something he has said, to... Look at the Roman Catholic Church and how many people it convicted based upon its demonic drivel. Mm -hmm. how, you know, look at, uh, at religious Jews and how many people they have convicted and condemned. Oh, yeah. Their demonic drivel. Oh, yeah. Look at, at socialist secular humanism. You know, the socialist secular humanists say, oh, we're the enlightened ones, the Antifa. Oh, yeah, we're the enlightened ones. We're going to liberate you. And of course, Hardly. they... Uh, the opposite is true. Enslave everybody. Yeah, yeah, enslave everybody. Take away everyone's mm -hmm. liberty. Deprive everyone. Uh, everything they say is mischaracterized and falsified. So God is saying, listen, uh, you uh, are going to be excluded from the relationship. You're going to have missed the way if your words um, in the public places and uh, mischaracterized and falsely convicted. But say, you know, if, if you want to say something stupid to someone, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, is never going to know you when it's just quietly under your breath, all eh, right, what's the harm? But you go into a public place and you start yeah. pontificating rabbinic Judaism or Islam or socialist secular humanism, uh, rabbinic Judaism or Christianity, mm -hmm. Yahweh says, yeah. Then, you're, you're a target. If I mischaracterizing and falsifying what I have said in a public place, then I'm going to deem that you are disseminating that which misleads and thrusts aside. You have chosen to devalue and negate, 
even confuse and convolute that which is right. There is a consequence for that. There is a penalty associated with that. For this reason, thus says Yahweh, concerning the house and family of Jacob, who, to show the way to the benefits of the relationship, redeemed and liberated them through Abraham. Jacob shall no longer be confounded or ashamed. No longer will his face appear pale, being perplexed and humiliated. This is the last that we're going to uh, to quote from this mm-hmm. passage tonight. And after we've commented on this, Kirk, okay. we will uh, no longer be uh, broadcasting. We will be uh, uh, recording, and I would encourage you to uh, go ahead with your ANA uh, research. Okay. Uh, and sure. I am okay. I made it 30 minutes longer than I thought I was going to, but I will be off to, yes, uh, to bed here well, and well done. within moments. Happy Sukkah to everyone. Uh, this is what God just said. For this reason, because people have corrupted and misrepresented his uh, testimony. They have wrongly convicted people uh, based upon their religious doctrines. Yahweh says that concerning the house and the family of Jacob, to show the way to the benefits of the relationship, they're going to be liberated and redeemed from them. And that liberation and redemption is going to come through Abraham. This is Jacob benefiting from Abraham. Jacob is Israel. These are not Gentiles. This is not a church. Jacob is Israel. And it is Israel that is going to benefit from the relationship, is going to be liberated from the toxic religious promotions of the rabbis, by the harassment of Christians and uh, by Muslims, they will be redeemed through Abraham. Jacob represents Israel. Abraham represents the covenant. Hmm. God is saying that the remnant of my people who are going to be redeemed and restored is going to happen because they have studied, they know, they understand, they agree with, and they have accepted and acted upon, acted upon the conditions of the covenant as they were laid out through Abraham. Abraham is not a redeemer. Abraham is not a liberator. Abraham is not a savior. Abraham is symbolic of the covenant. Jacob ain't coming back. The house of Jacob is Israel. God is saying, it's Israel that I am going to liberate and redeem through the covenant. Jacob shall no longer be confounded and ashamed. No, Jacob is going to know the truth. Jacob is Israel is going to respond to the truth about Yahweh, to his Torah, to his covenant, to his Moed Mikre. Their face will no longer be pale from being perplexed and humiliated. They're going to understand. That is our mission. That is Yahweh's goal. Happy Sukkah to one and all. Uh, Kirk, I, I'm going to leave it with you. Uh, thank you. Okay, for I'll, the, I'll go uh, to my notes and thank you. And for thank the, you uh, for the uh, to, uh, to yeah, carry yeah. on. Uh, and I'm going to okay. give my headset to Leah. She may chime in while you're doing your, okay. uh, your presentation, uh, okay. uh, Kirk. But good night, everyone. Happy Sukkah. Good night. Shalom, shalom, my friend. In, in any case, what I what he was alluding to is something I wrote him a, um, a couple of notes, a couple of pages of notes, um, handwritten notes, and, and basically I was studying the word ana, which uh, is either translated answer or afflict. If you're using strong numbers, you'll find it in 630 and 631, uh, two verbs. Um, and I did it in my usual fashion. I go through all the lexicons that uh, everyone else does, and I also uh, look at the words and try to figure out what the words, the letters rather are saying, and also how they are laid out, and uh, a few other things. So I'm just going to read to you what I wrote down so I don't get uh, too bogged down. Is that you, Leah? So, yeah. 
Okay, so Anna is written with uh, three letters. We've already talked about that just a minute ago, but you say a yin is pictured as an I, I then a nun, which is pictured as a sperm or a C, in this case a sperm. I use means continuance. The I can be um, to observe, to look closely, uh, to cons- carefully consider, and also perspective. And the hey is a really interesting uh, letter. Is with it is pictured as a person that's standing up, engaged. Their legs are apart, so they're walking. They're walking down the uh, pathway home. Uh, their hands are up and looking in awe. It's a, it's a wow factor. They are revering, respecting uh, Yahweh, certainly revering. So you look it up, and it's going to say, believe it or not, it's going to say to testify. It's going to be to sing. I think of that like singing songs that Dode wrote in his psalms. It means to answer. It means to respond. It even even to announce something. Uh, the letters show man's eye, his perspective, watching the watching the nun, the symbol of continuing family, becoming upright and engaged uh, uh, with Yahweh. The hey is saying, behold, look at this awesome sight, and respond, and they're responding appropriately, which is what he's asking you to do on all these Moya Mikras. Further. The Ayin or the An uh, represents the understanding and the ability to perceive something awesome. It represents the number 70, which is very interesting. That's the promise number, all things that are seven, uh, like the promise of the Shabbat. The Nun is an interesting uh, letter that also is the number 50, which alludes to the reconciliatory day of um, Kippurim. But also it is the Yobel year when all sins are forgiven and all debts are forgiven and you're set free. So those are tremendous attributes there. And it also alludes to, um, I'm sorry, while the uh, hey is the number five, the significance of the number five representing the five terms and conditions for becoming part of Yahweh's family, the covenant relationship. So then I have to wait into that. So I can't find anything negative there, and I can't find any reason why it would be a flick as I was looking through. So I kept on going. Most people don't go to the two-letter root, but the, a lot, most of the Hebrew words have a two-letter root. And if you look them up, you'll find that this one is a an, which is the uh, perspective, the eye that's looking at a sperm. And it means the eye on continuance uh, and continuance of the family. So the root of the matter is exactly that. It's an eye looking at uh, family continuing. And the concept of the old concrete language, how it would have been understood, is that the shepherd is keeping a close eye on the sheep in order to protect them. Obviously, that's a metaphor for Yah and or Dode or the father of a particular um, family where he is usually standing outside the gate or sitting outside the doorway, rather, of the tent and uh, watching over and for protective reasons or just a shepherd out there observing the sheep and watching over them to make sure they're safe. So next I went to Brown's Drivers and Briggs, which you can find online uh, very easily, and most people have that one is a uh, lexicon, where I found that answer it means to answer, to shout, to testify, to announce, and respond. And so far I still haven't gotten to the tradition of uh, rabbinic Judaism where you – have to afflict yourself. Then I went to one of my favorites, oldest favorites, is Jensenius's Hebrew uh, Chaldean lexicon of the Old Testament, or the only testimony, as I like to call it. And it gives 15 meanings for Anna in several pages before it even offers afflict. And as we know, that's probably only done because the people who buy these lexicons, for the most part, they'd be out of business if it was just us. They would. Um, they have to have some assemblance that uh, it means afflict, I guess. And it cites multiple sources, and one of those is um, uh, <clears throat> Alcara 16, 31, 23, 27, and 32, Numbers 29 and 7, and even Psalms 119, verse 71. So I looked up all of those, by the way, and uh, they were all um, really mistranslated. Uh, throughout the whole verse, they've used every kind of religious uh, word there is, holy, um, convocations, and it was just a, a really botched job. And most of those uh, have been translated by Craig, and you could see, look those up as well if you wished. But in all of the above, it translates, um, they're cha- translating Chog. Now, Chog, as you know, is a festival feast. 
on Passover we'll Seder is a party. We go in, we celebrate and break bread with Yahweh and have a wonderful time. And why? That would come down to being laced with the meanings of to bow down, to be humbled, to humble your soul. All of that seems totally out of character for uh, these verses, if you if you read them correctly or translate them correctly. There's even a part about Daniel 10:12 where the angel or the malak is simply saying to him that I am responding to your question and your request. So once again, how would you get uh, the meaning to be, um, to afflict? I don't know. Uh, I went to the theological workbook on um, the only Testament and it defines honor as to answer, respond, testify, speak out. And by the third section, which is many pages away, uh, it offers, finally offers, uh, afflict as a possible meaning. And if it means afflict, it means humble, to humiliate, oppress, and force to submit, as in, um, as in um, Islam. Difficult, um, I find that very difficult to uh, grasp with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with free will at work. So then what would be the point, was my question. As I'm thinking about this, and I'm saying these people have lived through, now let's think about, about um, Yom Kippurim in 2033. These people have stayed the course, have lived through Jacob's troubles, the worst times the worst times ever in the history of the world, and are responding to Yahweh's invitation to Chog to uh, have a party with him, to uh, celebrate with him. Um, do you really think they have to be beaten up, that they would have to... Uh, Fast? How do you fast at a feast? And that kind of, uh, <laughs> some of this is really stupid. I'm sorry. And if one believes that they are to afflict oneself, then you, I would ask the question, I would ask this question, and how do you deal with this verse, which is Kara or Leviticus 23:30, where Yahweh says, And any soul who by association performs any of the business of the heavenly messenger on this life-sustaining day, Yom Kippurim, that that soul I will annihilate from the midst of the family. Listen, you can't earn this. You can't. Um, and, and you're insulting Yahweh just by doing things or acting like you're doing something important. To, to ask people to um, afflict themselves, to fast uh, at a chog, at a party, and especially one where he's reconciling the relationship, where he is inviting you to come back to his family and be part of his family, is the most ludicrous thing that I could think of uh, in this context. And uh, I just thought I would mention it because I was going to mention it last week only because so many people would be going to the temple uh, and they would be afflicting themselves in such and whatever way, whether it's a fast or solemn looks or whatever this should be i know it'd be a tough place if you're coming from the from that last uh in the in 2033 but it should be a place of joy it should be a wonderful day a greeting uh to be there with yahweh and uh everything should be happy everything should be wonderful so enjoy the feast and that's about all i had to say and i was it was very thankful he let me uh chime in and um we appreciate it, and I wish you all, all a, a happy uh, sukkah. And uh, I, may I just say shalom, shalom. Good evening.